can see about two of you with that light, but nonetheless, it's always a bit like that. Well, um, great turnout. Uh, good to see you all here. Um, it's, I hope that the others managed to escape the train gauntlet um, and, and, and also make it into the room. Yeah, I'm going to talk uh, a bit about, um, about this whole uh, reality hacking frame from the perspective, I guess, of a little, um, of a little, uh, a little history. I want to start with um, the, 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 uh, the proposition that this, of course, has actually been happening for, for quite some time. Um, and uh, I, I, I think that we could, we could quite safely say that, that, that playing with perception in itself is, is, is very much an, an age-old human project. It's a project which um, has found its, 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 um, its, its feet in the, in, in the very early practiced arts of trompe l'oeil, for instance, uh, perspectival anamorphosis, uh, optical illusion art uh, relatively recently, but nonetheless there's been this, this innate suspicion that, um, that how we see the world in itself may be separate from what the world actually comprises. And so one could actually say that reality hacking um, uh, finds evidence in, in, this, in this very engagement with, um, with perception itself, that it's about taking a critical position in relation to the way that we perceive. Uh, in order to better understand our relationship with the world itself. And this is a kind of critical subjectivity that you see in hacking communities themselves in relation to, uh, to technology. Um, now, um, much of this, of course, has been done more in the visual space rather than the, the, rather than the oral space, for instance, or the, or the strictly um, sensory space, say, in tactile um, or olfactory. But nonetheless, um, we, we can generalise a little bit um, this practice in, in relation to developing that kind of critical subjectivity from the from the visual space, um, one way of thinking about this is that um, is that the perspectival anamorphosis of art, trompe l'oeil, uh, illusion art, et cetera, et cetera, is is really targeting the visual cortex itself as the site of of, exi of exhibition. One can think of um, of of a kind of art that exists that exists not in the world in itself for itself, but somewhere in between. Um, Plato, trying to come to terms with this a couple of thousand years ago, um, said that the, that the image exists at a point, um, um, that the point of intersection between light that, that emits from the object and another, another ray of light that emits from the gaze, as though the, the image itself is somehow suspended in between um, our sensory apparatus and, and the object itself. Um, so yeah, we, we really see that in work like this, for instance. One of my favorite artists of all time, um, Varini, um, really explores this. We, we can start thinking about a, a plane of synthesis or a plane of perception that, that Varini's interested in, 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 in bringing into the very world itself in his work of uh, perspectival anamorphosis. Now this in itself um, appears to us when in the environment as an image that sits up from the world presenting itself uh, to us. But of course it's not. It's distributed across a great many planes. So um, one finds oneself um, synthesizing an image from many parts. Why? Because we need this kind of coherency and we look for it. Um, and I, I, I consider this a, a very rigorous um, uh, in, a work of interactive art in itself. We also see this with the very famous uh, Pepper's Ghost, which comes up again and again in conversations about uh, augmented reality. We see the actual plane of synthesis itself uh, manifest um, as, a, as a piece of glass. Downstairs we have a guy wearing a sheet, uh, someone's blasting a huge amount of, of light uh, at that person, and, the, and the, the symptom of reflection appears in the glass. So from the audience's perspective, it looks like uh, there is a ghost on stage being attacked by a man with a knife for some reason. Um, Pepper never said. Um, this is a wonderful work here as well, A Mind Your Step, um, by a guy, uh, Eric Johansson. He's a, um, he's a Swedish chap. Uh, this is a very recent, uh, recently, um, uh, recent intervention in Stockholm. Um, he, he, he used perspectival anamorphosis in a brilliant way and really worked with the tiles in the, in the street. One sees from this particular perspective what, what overtly appears to be a huge cavity in the ground in the middle of a, of a big square in, in Stockholm. What's interesting is that people started playing with the perception of those people viewing that, that, that cavity, that, that, that supposed cavity. There was this kind of conversation there that I find very, very interesting. Of course, seen from another perspective, it's just a big piece of vinyl, a picture. 
So um, all of this really um, um, points to a kind of playing uh, with believing, and I, I think it's important not to, not to think about augmented reality as a kind of um, coherent um, uh, replacement reality in itself, so much as, as, a, as, a, as, as, as very much a, um, a continuation of this tradition of, of kind of jamming with our, with our perception, um, exploring new ways of being with our perception and therefore with the world through it. Now, I, I assume that um, most of you here know what uh, augmented reality is, but to put it very, very simply, um, it, it is really born, it's a technical term, term born out of a, out of a, a computer vision frame uh, largely, um, and to achieve augmented reality in its traditional sense, one requires a camera, a, um, a, um, a, a computer, and, and a screen. The idea is that one composites um, uh, fictitious content, digital content, over the top of a live video feed such that it appears part of the scene. And there are many ways of doing that. I won't go into too much detail, but I've spent quite a bit of time in this space and as a computer programmer and as, a, as, a, uh, as an artist. Now, one work I'd like to show you um, um, uh, that I did in 2007, 2008, it was probably the third work of augmented reality that I did, but really the first one that I was quite happy to publish. Um, I, I think it demonstrates quite, uh, quite clearly, quite tangibly, uh, what augmented reality is. This is using fiducial marker tracking, markers that, um, that are, are black and white, asymmetrical, such that they can easily be tracked uh, by software uh, following a video feed as captured through a camera. Um, but the experience, when looking at the screen, uh, is this. The screen, in, in this sense, becomes the plane of perception that, um, that Plato was talking about. It's very much um, a, a kind of, I guess, a, I would say a poor representation of what Varini's doing. And, and, and in the case of Pepper's Ghost, it is also not so different um, in, uh, in, in many respects. I'll show you a little video of that. I'm going to need to... Thank you. 
So that's a level head. Um, oh, cheers, thanks. Wow, you're very generous this morning. You must be a good coffee here in Brighton. Um, the, yeah, the, um, the, this, this is very much a, a tangible um, interface uh, prototype in itself. It's, obvi it's obviously inspired the, um, the, the interest of a lot of toy companies and the like. Um, the, the idea, of course, is that it's a, it's a maze. One walks a, a man uh, around this room around, uh, around these, uh, these cubes, trying to find the exit, and you hop between the cubes. But it could, of course, go on forever. Um, this is me doing a, a speed run of it, so I'm, I'm just seeing how fast I can do it myself. Some, I think the last cube takes the average person around 45 minutes to solve. Um, so yeah, AR, a replacement reality. I mean, in, in, order, in order for augmented reality to be a replacement reality, just operating within the visual domain, we'd need to be walking around in this classy uh, headgear. Uh, here, which I doubt many except the more frightening people on earth um, are prepared to do. Um, so, um, to, I mean, there's been a huge amount of hype about, about augmented reality as a replacement reality. I mean, some have even written about it as a kind of, of a threat. We saw the same thing, of course, with, uh, with virtual reality. Um, that old horse um, soon died. Um, and it's almost that, that the specter of it is returned in the form of, of AR. Um, and I, I guess my augmented reality check would be that, um, that it, AR is actually a very rarely experienced, rarely useful, occasionally engaging uh, screen experience. And I guess all the uh, startups and, um, and uh, venture capitalists would not like me to be saying that, but it's a bit true, really. Yep. Um, and what's more interesting for me is, is the augmented reality effect, which, which I think says a lot about our desire to have a, um, have a, have a far more um, nourished or, or at least plastic mutable uh, reality. One even sees, for instance, that um, YouTube videos um, of augmented reality demos inspiring hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments by people that not only have not used um, that particular or engaged with that particular work, but probably have not yet engaged with augmented reality itself. Um, it, it, th this idea that, that, that the reality can be more than, than it appears um, represents a kind of a playful and very innate endemic relationship that we have um, with, um, with uh, or we, we would like to have with, uh, with reality itself. Um, it's really important to not mistake the, uh, the medium for the manipulation when thinking about augmented reality in this case, and of course reality hacking, um, therefore. The manipulation happens, uh, happens in the cognate um, superstructures of, of, of our very beings. Um, our, our, our perceptual um, prostheses um, and, and our cognate um, um, uh, self represent the, um, the, the bits and pieces required to have a kind of conversation that allows for this, uh, this manipulation. It doesn't happen on the screen, holding uh, in one's hand, squinting in the sunlight, looking at the finger jam or trying to look through the finger jam of one's iPhone. Um, AR itself is a term uh, soon to be very much uh, obsolete, I believe. It's a clumsy term in itself, and I have um, produced a very handy little graph that I think will, um, I think will explain that. Uh, UX is user experience, of course, but um, you know, uh, it, people aren't going to be talking about augmented reality in, in, in 20 years' time. They're going to be talking about um, a, a, a just another screen experience or an interaction design, a user experience in itself. 
But my use of improved reality was to make a tactical separation with augmented reality in itself and start to position it in a, in a more strategic uh, frame. In the Advertiser project I kicked off in 2008, I wrote a few thousand uh, lines of, 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 of C++ that would allow for the, um, the, the natural feature tracking of advertisements um, such that they could be replaced with, with art. The idea, of course, is to take a very, very dense urban uh, um, um, you know, image landscape like this and, 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 and see if I could actually reposition those images and that whole scene, if you like, as a kind of exhibition space. Of course, this is um, an image which puts it quite simply. How can one get one's art up onto that billboard? And when I say up onto that billboard, I'm already playing with believing by saying that. But I was quite surprised at how willing audiences, particularly in the street, were willing to, to, to see their city in, in another way. Um, about making the, the, these proprietary images, um, these unnegotiable images that simply pop up overnight, we even occasionally see the, the men and women putting them up, making these proprietary images in our commons negotiable again. The starting point was to build a pair of binoculars, digital, uh, the billboard interception unit, that's what I decided to call them. <laughs> the idea is the advert comes in the front, um, the, the, the software picks out the, the advert itself, um, and then uh, swaps it for art and then passes those photons on to the, uh, to the visual cortex. There they are again. There's some people using them in the street, they're a bit chunky. But they're sort of in, they're in this retro-futuristic kind of way that draws the crowds in. But I mean, it's really nice when you're giving a workshop. Um, artists um, can pick a brand like Calvin Klein, Helmut Lang, Burger King, and then put their work um, on that billboard for, for, the, for the duration of the, of the street exhibition. This was a lovely moment. Um, here's, a, here's a McDonald's um, a manager in Rotterdam. Um, he, 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 was, he was a very quiet man. He was a very thoughtful chap. He came out and just, and just squinted, staring at the, um, at the people holding the binoculars, and then back at the billboard, and then back at the binoculars, and then back at the billboard. <laughs> It was deeply, deeply upset by the, by, by, by the, by the image. Sooner or later, we had him. <laughs> yeah. he, actually, he actually called a woman out um, who came running out saying that, there was needing, uh, that he needed to be back inside. He put his hand up and then just, and then just uh, continued to use the binoculars. <laughs> I, I think we made him more quiet. Um, yes, yeah, so I'll show you a very quick video in the interest of time. What have I got here? People really hate Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, it's, it's incredible. We had about six or seven um, um, f uh, fucking donuts. I said fucking. Um, okay, uh, back here. Um, yeah, we have to move forward a little quickly. Um, yeah, another way of knowing the familiar, the advertiser is, is very concerned with that. But um, nonetheless, the, the, the improvement of reality, if you like, um, are making the, the unnegotiable negotiable, another way of knowing the city. Still, the participation is voluntary. And that's where um, um, I started to 
move away from, from visual AR and start to explore um, a much older um, a hobby of mine since I was quite young, which is, um, which is hacking. I mean, I, I, I do a lot of in the, in the line of, of working with networks and manipulating networks and the data that moves over them. Um, I work a lot with this chap, Daniel Vasiliev, who also happens to be our Russian model in the, uh, in the previous video. Um, we have a studio in, in Berlin together. Um, and uh, our Project Newsweek is the one that got the, uh, got the, got the, got the golden nicker at, at ours. Um, the idea is, is, is to work with this very, very, very personal um, uh, relationship one has with the device in one's pocket, the phone, or a laptop or a tablet, and actually look at how one can actually manipulate the, um, the, the data in that space. Um, we refer to a browser-defined reality in this case. What, when news is, for instance, conveyed through the browser, one sees the logo of the, uh, of, of, of the, um, the Guardian or Al Jazeera or something like this. We immediately trust that, that content comes directly from the server in our imagination. There's the server and there's the browser on our device. Um, um, we, we see this, for instance, and we trust it. Um, but every topology is a control structure, and just in a network context, if you have control over the topology, you have control over the uh, over the um, over the the the, the, the browser-defined reality that passes over it. Um, and what we did is we um, we we worked with an age-old network exploit um, to make sure that um, that that a device of ours, a news-tweaking device, could be inserted in the network. It would route all of the traffic of that network through the device, giving us full control. Of the, of, of the news that's actually read on the devices using that, using that wireless access point. Plug it in a library, um, an airport, a school, and the, the network literally becomes a reality island. Um, not Ireland, but a reality island. <laughs> I did say Ireland, didn't I? Ireland. No, but um, and then, then, then one can, for instance, go off to Toronto or, or Vanuatu or something like that, and then manipulate the news read on that network. The device itself is deliberately boring. It looks like a part of the infrastructure. It's a small um, wall wart, a wall plug, with a power pass-through, which is important. One plugs it into the wall, um, and then one can be, in, for instance, in Berlin, and be manipulating that network. Here's an example. Um, Beijing to invest in US Army. <laughs> Rupert Murdoch, gross tail. <laughs> This, this one was really nice. We actually saw this one at ours. We had about a thousand tweaks a day in the exhibition, and, um, and this was one of the favourites. Rupert Murdoch grows tail. We actually caught the guy doing it, so we, we asked him if he could take a screenshot on his iPhone. Um, but this is also very nice. It's sort of a non-news. Man with Al-Qaeda links not killed in Afghanistan. This is, this is gold. It's really great. Um, but I'm going to show you a video right now, um, and then I'll, I'll leave the stage. It's not that people think they're being subject to propaganda. If people don't think that, they aren't looking for that, they're much easier to propagandize. And that's the genius of our media system. That's a real bakery in Berlin. Media is the nervous system of a democracy. If it's not functioning well, the democracy can't function. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thanks a lot.